everyone, welcome to this interesting session today on uh, open data presented by Thomas King, who is the data administrator of the Royal 4 d project, uh, which is a project in the Center for Innovation in Learning and Teaching at the University of Cape Town. Um, I'll share a link to that in a minute. But yeah, over to you, Thomas. We're looking forward to learning more about the, the what's and the how's of open data. Thanks, Nicola. Um, welcome, everyone. As Nicola very kindly introduced me, I'm Thomas King, just research administrator for the raw for d project. That's how I pronounce, by the way, raw for d standing for the Research on Open Educational Resources for Development. Um, we are a... Oh, sorry, before I start, I'd just like to absolutely give my um, thanks and for the very informative session produced um, by Nodumo Dilbi on Monday. Was it Tuesday? Monday, um, where she overlaid the general state of open data in Africa, particularly from a government and policy perspective. While Nodumo's presentation laid the groundwork from a, a high-level, top-down perspective, I'm going to be looking at how a single project has dealt with this from a bottom-up perspective. Sorry, let me just get the slides working. There we go. So there's our project the Research on Open Educational Resources uh, for Development project. We are a network hubbed project, which means we have a local coordinating team here at the University of Cape Town and 18 sub-projects across 26 different countries from Chile to Mongolia. We count around 100 researchers within our uh, network who are producing research on all different topics related to the production, adoption, use, reworking, revisiting of open education resources in the global south. Due to the range of projects that we have under our team, we have data sets from in Spanish, in Mongolian, in Kannada, which is an, English, an Indian subcontinent language, and in English. And this data is mostly of a mixed methods nature. In other words, a mix of quantitative and qualitative data. Within the projects, within the network team here at the University of Cape Town, we have what's called the Raw for the Open Data Initiative, which is a voluntary initiative um, which seeks to help our sub-project researchers publish their data openly. Um, this was not an original project output. It emerged from the work that we've been seeing in other data projects that we've been involved in, and very much in keeping with the general raw for d uh, strategy, which is building the empirical base of OER research in the Global South. By the way, please feel free to ask questions in the comments, and I'll address them at the end of my session. Here we have a visual, visualization sorry, of where our various projects are based. As you can see, we have a large quantity in South America, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and in South and Southeast Asia, plus Mongolia. This is just to get a sense, uh, give you a sense of the range of different geographical and cultural areas that we deal with. And I'll be talking about how some of that implements on the data work that we do. Now, just some definitions. When we talk about open data, we're talking about something quite specific. Microdata is whatever data has been collected which forms the basis of analysis. This can include unit record data, for instance, survey data, census data, socioeconomic data, interview and focus group transcripts, anything that is used to produce the, quant to produce the analysis. So, for example, in the scenario that researcher X has collected 25 interviews and analyzed them, published a journal article from that research, and used the findings of that article in the class she teaches, the interview transcripts themselves are the potential open data. The journal article is an open access output, and the presentation is an open educational resource. We'll be speaking about primarily about open data here. Now, in many instances, the people will use these terms in various different ways. People will say, I teach from my journal articles, so my journal articles are open education resources. Or the data that I'm using is a data analysis of various journal articles. Those are all very fair uses. In this case, we are speaking specifically about that topic at the top, which is microdata. Now, here comes the big question is why to share? And within our project, we have a very simple reason, um, a very straightforward reason, 
which is building that empirical base. The capacity for open data, or data work in general, to leverage the, the power of the global research economy is massive. There is a great deal of replication of um, unnecessary work, reworking of previous studies, and a lack of latitudinal studies, which take data from a variety of different contexts and synthesize them into single outputs. So from our perspective, as we are trying to build the empirical knowledge base of OER research, very uh, coherent with that is building the open database. It's also a good practice for the future. Um, many research funders, major research funders in Europe and America, which still tends to dominate the research funding scheme, are increasingly requiring data, act data sharing activities or plans to be drawn up in their um, uh, contracting phase. Open data is becoming or will become mainstream relatively soon. It may not it may more be data management, but nevertheless, beginning to engage very strategically and very consciously with how one curates, shares, or curates and shares data is very important. But primarily, and I'll be coming back to this point again, is improving rigor. Sharing data openly demands that your data is very well organized, cleaned, create, curated, and so forth to produce something which is defensible. And the amount of scrutiny and constant reworking, improvement, um, validation that goes into open data sharing really does enhance the quality of the data, so, data set itself. This isn't something new. This is entirely in keeping with the general theme throughout academia of improving the quality of research. And open data really shines that spotlight on your data, which is, after all, the foundation of every single piece of analysis and output that you create. Now, the question becomes, is how do we recruit people? How do we make them want to do this? And there's a variety of different strategies, and I'm sure there are other strategies as well. The ones I just identified for the purpose of this presentation are emphasizing the social justice aspect, that if you are sharing your open data, you are allowing other researchers to take what you're using and build on it in their own studies. And this has a wide range of possible outputs from increased biomapping for population transfers, for disease management, for disaster management, etc., etc. There is a wealth that can be done, and that's kind of um, coherent with all the sorts of sharing of open access outputs and open educational resources. A second strategy is emphasizing the personal reputation development. If you are sharing your data, you're sharing another aspect of yourself. You are putting yourself out there. And it doesn't have to be purely personal. It could also be a, um, on a project basis. But the more you share, the more visible you are. And the more visible you are, the more But again, again, we come back to the primal one, which is this idea of, of emphasizing the rigor. Trust me when I say this, taking your data and sharing it openly means you will go over that data again and again and again, and you will ensure that the data is as valid and as comprehensive and as clean and as presentable as possible because of the increased scrutiny that anyone could be looking at this data. There's no room for fudging your data when you're sharing it openly licensed on the web. And in my opinion, this is the one which resonates most strongly with academics because no academic is ever going to say, well, I am uninterested in producing rigorous research. This is another means to enhance that rigor. That's the why, now for the what, and which is you're preparing your actual data set for publication. And just take another break quickly, just to do some terms and definitional work. We speak of de-identification, which is removing, eliding, or replacing any information which could reveal your research participants or reference identity. That's the macro category. Underneath that are two subterms which are not the same, anonymity and confidentiality. If a research is anonymous, your personal details were never gathered in the first place. If your research is confidential, it means your personal details were gathered but it will not be shared. You cannot have you because you will know the identity of the person you're interviewing. It is very possible to have a confidential interview where you know it, but you do not share that in your data or your research. So typically, we talk about confidentiality when talking about qualitative research. Anonymity is more applicable to quantitative research. 
not necessarily. I mean, if you're collecting survey data and you're collecting names and so forth, you are no longer anonymous. You're not moving the confidential space, but just for some shared terminology as we move along. Now, the the basis of the raw for d open data approach, open data initiative, sorry, is we're based on two pillars. Data. We do not share unless we have full consent from our researchers. We ensure that ethical processes have been adhered to, and we ensure all legal processes have been adhered to. The ethical side of things is very much in keeping with standard research ethical um, provisions, as would have been in many different research contracts. The legal aspect means we, when we share data, we share data in a legal sense. Now, this is not exactly in uh, contradiction with, but it is there's a tension between this pillar and the other pillar, which is sharing data sets which are comprehensible, coherent, and valuable. Now, as I said, these aren't in opposition, but they are something which needs to be balanced. If you are ensuring your data is completely confidential and completely anonymous, you may have to remove as much um, certain quantities of the data which actually reduce its value. And this is a, a, an interplay between these two functions which needs to be carefully negotiated. And our principle has been to remove as little as is. Sorry, next slide. Principles can be expressed. On the left is first do no harm. In other words, be ethical and legal and consensual, but also don't go overboard. Remove as much as needed to ensure the confidentiality confidentiality or anonymity of the research participants, but remove as little as is ethical to ensure the richness of the data. This is a balancing act. There is no one-size-fits-all approach, and there are many different ways to think of confidentiality and anonymity, which I can't get into here. But what we do is we take the unit of analysis as the guide. We de-identify up to the unit of analysis. So for instance, if we are comparing academics at two institutions, and the comparison between these two institutions forms the basis of the analysis, we can easily or happily, safely, remove identifiers lower than the university affiliation itself. It is probably not necessary in that case for us to say that the head of department of anthropology at the University of Catalonia says this, while the DVC of re teaching research at UCT says that, if we are comparing Catalonia and UCT to one another. The core here is, and that's the, that's the last point there, is your data must uh, may be useful to others in ways you don't anticipate. The law of unexpected co um, consequences means removing or taking a very hack and slash approach to de-identifying your data, removing large quantities of it may not always be the best way if other researchers can use it in different ways from what you did. And that is a big part of the open data sharing principle, is be, people being able to apply their own analyses, their own methodologies and frameworks to your data set. Please do ask any questions if you have them. Now, our work has primarily been around qualitative de-identification. And also the current uh, methodologies and typologies and so forth tends to deal with quantitative de-identification techniques. So I'm going to be focusing more on qualitative. Qualitative data, just to remind you, is tends to be things like interview tracking, very much in the same um, spectrum or ecosystem as your general data cleaning and validation work. When going through a transcript and looking at what elements of these things are going to identify my research participants, you will find things like spelling mistakes, you'll find things of broken grammar, um, erroneous transcription, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So the process of going through your data very much for um, a de-identification purpose very much brings out all the other issues in your data which could do with improvement. Um, those three points, cleanup typo, standardizing presentation layout, and identifying unanswered questions are data validation techniques which come out of your data identification process. Now, while a lot of these do apply to quantitative data, um, the quantitative data tends to be easier to de-identify in terms of 
remove the column with personal identifiers, remove the column with your identification numbers or social security numbers, for example. All of these processes, um, when it comes to qualitative data, become much more based on the interplay between different sets of information, um, the ways people refer to things in interviews and... Hi, Peter, can you hear me? Looks like we just lost Peter. Just one second, he's still around. Okay, perfect. Um, where was I? Uh, qualitative data. Um, the ways of de-identifying qualitative data tend to re um, re revolve much more strongly around um, rather than search and replace functions, for example, by regular and deep reading. And a very good way to start thinking about these kinds of issues is to develop your own research data management plan, um, which will then start bringing out the, the different um, things you need to think about in research data management generally, which will bring up your de-identification de principles. Let's move to the next slide. We, what we go through is something called the data interrogation process. by reading data. Now, this is very much in the context of our network approach. We have a unit here in the University of Cape Town and research is distributed all across the world. We don't involve ourselves directly in the research gathering process. We are dealing with other people's data sets, which we have been informed of and we have seen the methodology behind. But often the first time we see the real raw data is when they are interested in sharing open data. So the first step is always to read the data to go through very, very systematically through the, the data, set, data set itself. The second step is ensuring the coherence of the data. Now, I've just finished a master's myself, and so I can tell you that when I collected my data, I was not um, thinking of how it would be shared with other people. It was perfectly legible, legible to me and perfectly illegible to everyone else. So a process of standardization needs to take place where the data is organized in such a way that it is standardized, it's coherent, and it is organized in a logical sense. And you'll see the very next step is going back to reading the data again. Once you've reread the data, and every time you read the data, new things will emerge, we will head to an editorial process where you're doing a very basic um, set of reading through, identifying spelling and grammatical typos, and identifying anonymous data. Now, anomalous data tends to occur more in quantitative data sets, um, areas where people haven't answered a survey question or have answered it in due to survey design in a way which doesn't make sense for the rest of the data. A person, for example, has put their location as Nairobi and in their country. Once that process has been done, going back to reading the data again. Moving on to a validation process, which is identifying um, and accounting for missing data. Once, if you are looking at your own data sets, it's quite an easy process. You can realize the issues where you didn't collect data and either account for this, as in going out and actually collecting those data, that data again. In dealing with uh, a networked data set like ours, we go back to our sub project researchers, identifying areas which we are concerned about, which don't make sense according to their methodological structures, et cetera, et cetera. And once again, we return to reading the data again. This constant re-reading of the data is necessary to bring out over and over again the different issues which only emerge from repeated and thorough re-reading. The very last process is going through the de-identification itself, de -identification, sorry, process itself, which is the removal of um, direct and indirect identifiers. So just quickly remind you, this is our project um, system. We have a network hub team over here. And Michelle and I are part of the curation and dissemination team, which does this work, and numerous sub-projects. The de-identification process itself sets, uh, rests on two um, processes. One is a first level de-identification. Now, this is based on our process, and this will obviously be different depending on the various project structures that exist. Our contractual provisions state that we are not allowed to see disclosive data, we being Michelle and myself in the curation dissemination team. 
So before sending us their data, the sub project researchers themselves go through the data and remove these um, direct identifiers, which are things like names of people, institutions, and companies, ID or social security numbers, anything which is, can be directly linked to a person or a referent. Once that data has been prepared in that sense, it comes back to us. And we perform what's called a second level de-identification process. One, to collect any direct identifiers which fall through the mix, which always which kind of inevitably happens but more complicatedly is an in-depth sweep of the text to identify indirect identifiers. These could be things like, for example, I am the only person in my institution who works with malaria. And if I know the institution is the University of Nairobi, and I can go and find someone on the University of Nairobi's website, I can sense identify the person that I'm looking at. Or um, I am the HOD of my department, and later on the text, we find my department works exclusively with um, anesthesia. Very easy to work out someone's um, identity from those kinds of information. This process is not automatable. It is not something which can be machine learned. It is something which requires simple, hard slogging work. There are guidelines. Uh, the UK Data Service um, provides some guidelines on this process, but it's something which really just requires repeated, thorough rereading of the text. And in that repeated thorough rereading of the text, you'll pull up the issues we mentioned in the data interrogation process, especially these ideas of validation, finding data which doesn't fit. Now, we are blessed with an hour project in that we actually have a team which does this work. Um, myself. So this work does require some level of resourcing. It certainly can be done by individual researchers or smaller research teams but um, we've had the privilege of being able to spend specific time on this work. I don't want to bring this conversation back to an infrastructure one. Um, except in the case of some very specific kinds of data sets, um, particularly with qualitative data, most data is produced or can be converted to relatively easily um, absorbed um, software platforms, for instance, MS Office, Open Office, um, or the varieties of open source um, data software. And secondly, there is no reason that the lack of an institutional repository or institutional data service should prevent people from sharing data openly because of the prevalence of uh, free data platforms, for instance, places like Zenodo or Figshare. I would say infrastructure is probably not the crucial um, linchpin preventing people from sharing. There is a legal aspect, which is your institution may not um, give you permission to share. So I'm speaking here specifically of universities, and I imagine some NGOs also, where the research team itself doesn't actually have direct permission to share its outputs um, legally, except through specific university channels. And that's something which perhaps Nodumo could speak to more um, rigorously than I could. And then, of course, lots. Of, um, it requires a competency, which is some degree of familiarity with open licensing for the final publication process of the data, and de-identification skills. Really, a simple practice: going through a data set, producing some kind of output, some kind of clean set, sharing it with friends, trying yourself to go into other people's data sets and trying to work out identification. Simply do it. Um, I can share certain guidelines on how to do it, but the process really is best learned by doing it. And finally, it takes time. This is a fairly significant part of the work I do in terms of hours. Um, of course, we are dealing with 18 different projects, so we have a large um, quantity of data to work through. But it's not something which can be done um, as an afterthought 30 minutes before publication. This is something which does require uh, strategy and resourcing behind it. But that's time and these skills and these competencies and infrastructures are not based in the global north. They are not things that require an MIT or um, a CERN education to have. We can develop these skills wherever we are in the world. Now, there are challenges in this process. And in this case, I'm speaking partly from the raw 4D context, part, partly generally. Um, in our context, we have dealt with data set collected in multiple languages. Um, 
primarily we are thank, um, grateful that most of our data sets have been uh, collected in English, but we do have Spanish and Mongolian data sets as well. And in those processes, a lot more relies on the researcher, individual researcher's ability to perform a de-identification because I can't read Mongolian and my Spanish is poor at best. So for network projects and in Africa, I think your dominant language would be Swahili, English, Portuguese, and French. Some degree of research confidence that they will be able to produce to um, undertake these these activities themselves. In the case of getting consent for the data to be shared, particularly if this was not collected in the consent process right up at the beginning of the research, it's kind of quite difficult. Post hoc consent process is far from ideal. Departments close, uh, people play, they move on to new projects, they change email addresses. And I'm um, addressing how to deal with this later. And last. If you're working with data collected by multiple researchers, people have different collection strategies. Um, they develop shorthand which makes sense to them as the researchers and analyzers of data, which become a lot less obvious to someone who comes from the um, comes to the data completely foreign and has to work out how um, the data have been organized. So I'm going to close with some ways forward, which is if you are looking at open um, sharing data open in your project develop your openness by design. And I'm going to be very honest, we didn't. Um, we had the idea of sharing our research outputs openly, data where possible. But when we developed our strategy, we didn't understand the, the depth and the intensity of the work, particularly when it comes around to consent forms. Your standard consent form is tends to be based on a very sort of old fashioned Ethical and you'll see phrases like it will be used for research purposes only or data will be destroyed after use. Only researchers will have access to this data. So, uh, data will be kept in a locked filing cabinet in a particular location. All these processes become difficult when you want to share your data openly via places like Sonoda. They do not immediately stop you, but ethically you go back to your research participants and ask them. You sign a document saying this, can we now share our data in a different way? And research participants are notoriously difficult to get post, um, post project. So by far the best method is always design open in the beginning. Start off with your consent processes saying we will or might share data openly. And that will just ease your process dramatically. All right, um, I've come to the end of my session. Um, I hope I wasn't too rushed. Um, please do ask any questions within the uh, the chat, um, or if anyone has mics, you can ask me directly. I see Tony and Michelle are typing. Supporting documentation. Right, so when a data set has been shared openly, sharing the data by itself can be very opaque. If I all that I do is share a set of transcripts or a set of census data without some sense of how the data was collected, for what purpose it was collected, what the methodology behind it was, it becomes that much harder to to analyze. Likewise, if you got a research study and all they published was the findings and conclusion. So our particular data publisher is an institution called Data First, based at the University of Cape Town, and all their data sets come um, well, they require extensive metadata to be provided with the data set. The, this ranges from when the data was collected to what framework it was collected under, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, if this formed part of a broader study or if it's a standalone. And what we do is we help researchers, or we write and we uh, confer with researchers on how to describe their data sets to make it easier to uptake. Um, Peter, that's a problem. Um, do you uh, think maybe you could look read through the presentation? But of course, you probably can't. Um, if you have any questions generally about data management, just ask. Um, even if it has been brought up in the presentation, and I'll try and um, and just go over them again. Tony is asking such useful information. How much time do you spend preparing preparing data for open release? Whew. 
Um, I wish I could say it takes 20 minutes per page or so forth. It's unfortunately not nearly as um, quantifiable as that. I can tell you the kinds of work we do. Uh, we start off by scoping the data set to get a sense of what exactly is composed is composed of. For instance, is it interview data? Is it focus group or survey data? We describe that data set. Um, for the metadata process, which is collecting information on where it was gathered and so forth, which is usually quite quick. Um, if we're dealing with researchers and they're producing research reports, most of that information can be harvested from general reporting structures. It's multiple iterations of the process. Um, I'm currently working with 19 interviews for a project here at UC. It's taken the I don't know how many hours so far. I mean, I'm coming towards the end of it, but it does take quite a lot of time. It would probably be faster if I collected it myself, in that I knew what the, the scope of it was, and I would be able to identify um, dispersive information immediately because I was there collecting in the first place. I can't, unfortunately, give you a, a time scale. I will say quantitative data is generally easier to de-identify than qualitative data. Just the tabular nature of most quantitative data makes it easier to sort and replace, for example. Whereas qualitative data takes much more rereading. So, what I would ad advise then is not thinking of it as a uh, final process, but incorporating it more directly into research data management and uh, rigor and validation processes that normally apply to your data anyway, in which case. So thinking about study participants who have agreed for the data to use an anonymously for research, but were not asked RE open re release of the anonymized DDM data. Yes, it is definitely best to start with open data from, from the start of your project. Um, write it into your consent forms. And that doesn't mean you can just write it in. You need to explain what open data means, that it may be shared on open data. Um, uh, uh, permissions process, as I mentioned, are quite difficult um, and unreliable. They are possible in this post hoc. It is still possible. I mean, we, we do those situations that so we have to go back to our researchers, and we have gotten um, permission in the past to do so. So it's not impossible, it's just not easy. Kim says, thanks, Thomas. Which repositories do you recommend we submit data to? Does it depend on the data type slash research questions? Um, I didn't actually mention repositories other than Zenodo and SlideShare. Um, in a sense, I almost don't want to talk about repositories. Not that it's not a valid, uh, valid question, because it absolutely is. Um, but I wouldn't be quite as worried about where to share the data so long as it is shared. And um, Cheryl and Michelle may disagree with me about that. We use data first because it's local, it's based here. Um, it has a data stamp of approval, which is an international um, certification mechanism, but also because they help us work through the data on a very um, critical and very meticulous way. So we are um, supported in our endeavors. Places like Zenodo and SlideShare are, I mean, Zenodo and FigShare, sorry, are free to sign up. Um, they contain metadata. What they don't um, support you with is process management. They won't read your data. And they are not technically open data repositories. They are open repositories. People share all sorts of different things on there. Research outputs, OER, open data, etc. It's quite easy to do so. It doesn't take long to set up an account. It's absolutely free and it's supported by CERN, so it's not going away at any point. Um, go out and look for open data repository. If you can find one at your institution or within discipline which actually offers active support, then that's always going to be better than uh, something which just accepts whatever you upload to it. But not everyone has that capacity, and I don't think that should stop people who don't have that capacity from sharing. 
Otherwise, we're going to re get back to the same situation where the only people sharing open data come from MIT, Stanford, etc., and the global South is never going to get a foot in unless you start working sort of immediately. Nicholas says, um, what about service or interview questions without data? Is it still open data? Um, Nicola, can you can you uh, elaborate on that? Do you mean just the methodology itself? I was curious about that because whether people would still be sharing if they were only sharing the survey or interview question. So we are pretty much what you're asking. Um, interesting. I would classify that under supporting documentation myself. Certainly when we sh share our data sets openly, we include or try and include some of that information in supporting documentation. As a best practice mechanism, there is no reason why you should not be sharing a methodology. I would not tend to call that data myself as it's not the actual information from which you drew your analysis. It still has value in sharing, but I wouldn't say that is data in the same sense that microdata is. Also, in that case, you don't have to worry about the identification. You're just sharing methods and um, process, which is still valuable. But I generally wouldn't say that's open data. And I don't think many open data repositories, for instance, data first, would not accept that as data um, because it's not the actual thing from which you drew your conclusions. Uh, thanks, Michelle, for sharing the list of data repositories. No, thank you, Thomas. And if you could tell us a bit more about how journals are using or encouraging open data and are particular platforms that particular journals are preferring. I'll be entirely honest, this isn't a situation which I've had that much experience with myself. Um, certainly some journals do encourage it, and I believe that's more in your bioscience, I think, are leading the way in those um, those sectors. Um, it is certainly becoming part of the publication process generally. Uh, it's still in its infancy. Um, not that many journals, journals do it. It comes more in, in um, organization or, or large-scale research project funding. For instance, things funded by the European Union. Those tend to have much more um, direct and rigorous uh, requirements for research data management up front. As far as I know, most journals which ask for open data sharing don't require it. They ask it as an addition. I could be wrong on that, so please don't quote me on that one. Um, Michelle, do you know, um, can you pitch in there about um, journals requiring data management? Or anyone else for that matter? Um, I just want to pitch in and remind folks about the forum discussion happening on the Merge Africa site because uh, I know we're slowly going to be, we're running out of time so don't feel the conversation is over at 2 o'clock. Please continue to engage. Um, just following up on Thomas's point is that um, I once submitted a paper to a journal and they asked about open data and we had no um, at that time, the open data repository, and it was the first time I'd heard about open data. And what I know someone else who submitted to that journal did was just put it um, online on, on a you know sort of Google site, but it wasn't an open within a repository. So if it's not an open data repository, is it still open data? <laughs> That's a very good question, actually. Yeah. Yes, it is. It is still open data. The um, data, open data being defined by a data set which is licensed in such a way that um, encourages reuse. For example, Creative Commons. It is certainly not the most optimal method of sharing data. Uh, your large data repositories or general repositories, such as OpenUCT or Zenodo or DataFirst, have sophisticated backup and protection mechanisms that, in the case of data loss, they can recover the data set and ensure its accessibility into the future. Places like a website um, 
or a um, Google site, for example, are never guaranteed to have that same level of control and sophistication in ensuring that the data set is always available. They are also much less indexed by Google search engines or any kind of search engine, really, which makes the data that much harder to find. So there are still open data, but it is not an optimal mechanism for sharing open data. It's something which can be done, but it's not ideal. Uh, Tony, yes, even if you do share it on your blog or university profile page, so long as it is licensed in a way that unambiguously states its conditions for reuse, it would still count as open data. But there are so many open data platforms. Um, I go back to Zenodo because it's an open everything platform that there is no real reason not to share it on a, a proper um, platform. I mean, assuming no proper platforms exist. So. Yes, it exists, but there are better ways of doing it, which aren't difficult. So, it is a very easy platform to use. Does anyone else have any other questions they'd like to ask? And while folks are typing, I think I'd ask, you know, what does open data look like? Is it spreadsheets? Or is it Word documents? Thomas. I really should have started that with that, shouldn't I? Um, I can tell you what our open data looks like. Um, we shared our spreadsheets of survey data in CSV format, common set of period of values, which is an open format. We also share interviews in RTO format, rich text format, which is also um, readable by any kind of Office software, including open Office. Data is data is data. Data is what you use to draw your conclusions from. Um, format is important for um, aspects of who has access to it and how it is shared, and just things like file size. But format doesn't define data. The use for which it was collected and the use to which it's going to be put defines data. Um, but yes, I mean, for our context, it's, it's spreadsheets and Word files, well, RTF files, but uh, documents. It's nothing fancy. We do also share in proprietary formats, for instance, data, SPSS, more um, sophisticated quantitative formats. But that is a, a function that data, serve, uh, data First provides because they primarily deal with economic um, data, which does tend to come in those formats. That's not um, crucial. The format isn't crucial so long as it's something which can um, be accessed as, as widely as possible. And Cheryl's there is putting some um, portals about a data from Figshare and Data First. Right, if no one has any other questions, then I think we can close the session. Nicola, if that's right with you. Okay, and I just want to remind everyone again about the discussion forum. So once you um, leave the seminar and you've had a think, um, please come back in uh, to the Emerge Africa live site and share some of your observations and your thoughts uh, in the forum. We've signaled some particular um, questions in the announcements which went out earlier today. Um, yeah, I mean, feel free to start a new topic as well and continue the conversation. So just thanks from the Emerge Africa team uh, to Thomas King for sharing this really fascinating um, presentation that I think will get a lot of folks started on thinking more deeply about open data. Uh, and there's Thomas's contact details. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. And thanks everyone for joining us.